Hello and welcome. My name is Manuel Manny Rodriguez, and what I'm about to talk to you about is what is OBM, Organizational Behavior Management. This science has been around for ages, and what I want to do is just give you a high-level overview of what is, what is meant by Organizational Behavior Management. Let's start off by I want you to think about where you work and how you work. So if you work in a big company, a Fortune 100, 500 company with tens of thousands of employees, or even if you work from home as an independent contractor, I want you to think about your day-to-day, -day, where you work and how you work. And answer me this, can you identify at least one thing that could improve where or how you work? Think about efficiency, productivity, even safety. Can you identify one thing? Well, the majority of people that I ask this question to absolutely can identify at least one thing. More than likely can identify many things. Now, what if I was to tell you that there is a scientific way to make such improvements happen and sustain? Would you believe me? You probably would. But what scientific way am I talking about? Well, given the title of this course, it's probably no no uh, surprise to you, it's organizational behavior management. Organizational behavior management is the science of human behavior applied in the workplace. It's commonly referred to as organizational behavior management for those of us that are practicing or doing research in the field. However, you may have heard it from a different name. So I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit more about what is organizational behavior management. Now, to get us started, Organizational behavior management is a subfield in, in a broader science called applied behavior analysis. Florida Institute of Technology has a number of different programs in applied behavior analysis, including our ABA online program. Now, there are a number of focus areas that professionals find themselves practicing applied behavior analysis, and there's a professional organization called the Association for Behavior Analysis International aka ABAI. And these special interest groups or these fields of study within applied behavior analysis are called special interest groups, SIGs, and there are currently 36 active special interest groups such as autism, applied animal behavior, behavior analysis for sustainable societies, behavioral gerontology, gambling, health, sports, and fitness, speech pathology, and as the title of this uh, presentation suggests, the Organizational Behavior Management Network. Now, the Organizational Behavior Management Network has been around since the early 80s and currently is, uh, has achieved well over 500 active members worldwide. So practitioners in the field of organizational behavior management are really finding themselves a great set of opportunities within the context of the workplace, organizations. So what I'd like to do is kind of break down what is OBM. The O stands for organizational. So I want you to think about what that means. We're talking the overarching perspective of what is a company, it, the mission, the vision, the values, the overall culture of what an organization is and what it personifies to the open market. So from the stakeholders and shareholders, the market demand, the very products that the organization produces. The O stands for organizational, and pr uh, practitioners of OBM really take a, a scientific approach to understanding what is the O in organizational. What does it stand for? The B stands for behavior. This is what people say and do every day that's observable. This is by far the very foundation of what makes an OBM practitioner different from other practitioners. They focus on the fundamental activity that makes, behave, uh, makes work happen, which is behavior. We have an old saying in our field, if behavior doesn't happen, nothing happens. So in the workplace, the B stands for behavior. So the M in OBM stands for management. Here, what we focus on are the key strategies or initiatives that actually enable behavior to happen. So things like task clarification, job descriptions, processes and equipment, and even the very performance-based feedback that's given from managers and supervisors intended to make behavior happen and happen again. 
So OBM stands for Organizational Behavior Management. And as you look at each level, the practitioners and researchers in the field are really focusing on the whole picture, the organizational side, the behavior side, and the management side that brings it all together. Now, OBM has subdisciplines of their own, call it practice areas, if you will. Similar to how applied behavior analysis, the broader field has subdisciplines like autism and animal behavior and OBM. Organizational behavior management has really delved into a number of different subdisciplines or practice areas. So let me cover just, uh, just a few that are really some of the hallmarks of our field. The first one is performance management. Now, if you're in the field of human resources, this is probably a familiar term. However, in the context of OBM, it means something a little bit different. Performance management is really the management of individual employees or a group of employees that are looking to achieve some end goal, whether it's productivity or safe performance or efficiency or even quality, there's an end goal in mind. Performance management is the science of human behavior applied to understanding what can, what drives the behavior and performance of those individuals and or group of individuals. The OBM practitioner looks at performance management very systematically to say, what can I do to make behavior happen and sustain over a long period of time? So really what we do in performance management is not look at the individual at all, but look at the overall environment that influences the behavior of that individual. Behavioral systems analysis is another subdiscipline in OBM. It's really looking at the broader perspective. So a behavioral systems analysis really outlines how the components of the organizational system affects and interacts with one another. So to break it down, if you think of the organization as a system, you're looking at the big picture from the C-suite, right? So the goals, the mission, the vision, the five-year strategy, even those big, hairy, audacious goals that a CEO would set out to achieve, those, those systems play a role in the processes that individuals within the company have to interact with. So your sales process, your business development process, even the process for delivering or producing a product. Finally, at the individual level, it's those nuances, right? It's what people do every day that make up the culture. So what behaviors get reinforced, like showing up on time or showing up late? The very meetings that people hold to really drive performance. So whether you have a meeting on a weekly or monthly basis or you don't have any meetings at all, that's the individual behavior level that's all part of the analysis of a behavioral systems analysis. Finally, one area subdiscipline that's gotten a great deal of worldwide attention in OBM is called behavior-based safety. As the name implies, this is a focus on human behavior from the perspective of having people be safe every day. Now, behavior-based safety provides an analysis of what people do every day to be safe, whether it's proper lifting techniques, wearing PPE, maybe wearing a harness if they have to go on elevated work platforms. Or it could be even in the area of process safety. For those of you in the manufacturing world, this is that very important critical element of people interacting with machinery so that things don't go boom. Now, although these three subdisciplines are some of the more infamous or famous ones in our field of OBM, there's a few others that I wanted to pay particular attention to. First of all, there's the area of change management. Now, change management is more well known for kind of the emotional side of change. So whether people, uh, how they're affected by a change, like a merger acquisition or a new IT uh, platform, or sometimes it could just be a new leader in the organization driving change. So change management from an OBM perspective, we look at the behavioral side of change. So what fundamentally do we want people to do in the midst of change. So think of like a merger acquisition. There are specific behaviors you want people to do to make that change real. Now the essence of OBM from a change management perspective is not just to make the change happen, but to also make sure the change sustains over time. Another area that I've, I have a lot of fondness for is behavioral economics and consumer behavior analysis. This is by definition, looking at the behavior of the consumer, whether they're consuming goods or foods or consuming a product or buying a product or service. 
So what behavioral economics teaches us is this is a matter of choice. And how do we look at choice from a behavioral perspective to really make an impact on the bottom line of a company? Another area that is within the realm of OBM is training and development. I myself, with colleagues of mine, have been delving into the world of training and development in terms of leadership development. So whether it's specific skills on the job or it's more of a skill set for things that can generalize, like providing good effective feedback or coaching or looking at uh, long-term strategic planning. Training and development has very precise meaning in OBM because we look at to make sure that people are developing mastery or fluency in the skills that they're being trained on. That way, what they learn doesn't just stay in the classroom, it actually gets applied on the job. Another area, and it's related to what I just said in training development, is leadership development. This has actually become a pretty uh, niche focus area for OBM practitioners and looking at the very behaviors that leaders do to drive human performance in a workplace. So in my own, in my own experience working at the C-level, for example, CEOs, COOs, CFOs, what do they do to magnify and impact change and behavior change over time in the organization? Finally, kind of a nebulous term, if you will, is the subject matter of organizational culture. I mention this as nebulous because it's kind of fuzzy for most people. But from a behavioral perspective, culture is just what people do every day, and more importantly, what the company actually rewards or reinforces to make that behavior happen. So an OBM practitioner wants to understand organizational culture so that at the very least, we can appreciate what gets reinforced or what doesn't get reinforced. Another area that's really crept up in the last 10 years or so from an OBM standpoint is the world of healthcare and human services. The reason I mention like a time frame is that it's not that it's been neglected or forgotten, but OBM has now been paying a tribute to kind of the, 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 the increase, if you will, of change happening in the world of healthcare and human services from things like regulatory compliance and laws and professional accreditation. So OBM practitioners in this space are really focusing on two elements. One is the consumer's perspective, the, the patient satisfaction, if you will, or the consumer satisfaction of human services, but also the quality of services being delivered to those consumers. So healthcare and human services is another sub-discipline for a lot of OBM practitioners and research. Finally, the last kind of slice or sub-discipline that I wanted to focus on is health and fitness. This is, of course, has been around for the ages. But a lot of OBM practitioners, what they're doing is they're going into the workplace and companies are actually focusing their efforts on the health and fitness of their employees. As the saying goes, if you are an employee that is healthy and, and well, um, well taken care of, you're going to work longer. You're going to be happier at work as well. So organizations are investing lots and lots of money and lots of energy for making systematic decisions on how to improve health and fitness. Now, I am grateful for the opportunities that I have had in my own professional career. Um, and rather than taking you through kind of like my early years in the field to give you that perspective, I wanted to share some case examples, some stories of various applications of OBM related to uh, many OBM practices that you can see and learn about in literature today. So this is just a depiction of different areas in the world that I've had the, the privilege and honor to work at. And so these case examples I'm about to share with you come from many different parts of the world and highlight different applications of OBM. So let's talk about a few short stories here, and I'll try to keep them brief because I just want to give you a high-level overview of the impact and application of organizational behavior management. So the first story comes from a call center environment. If you've never been to a call center environment, we'll look at the picture. It kind of looks like this. There's a lot of individuals working hard. They're typically in cubicles or in smaller desks in front of a computer, and they have a headset. Why do they have a headset? Well, it's called a call center. They're collecting calls. They're answering phone calls. In some cases, some of the busier call centers are answering thousands of calls a day. And these calls run the gamut in terms of what the calls are about. It could be a quick, a quick fix, right? I need an account number, or I need information about my account or my outstanding bill. 
it could be a really detailed uh, IT issue, right? It could be a technical call where they need some troubleshooting advice. And so the reason why I highlight this is that in a call center environment, they're answering calls all the time for a wide range of issues. And the fundamental principle of a call center, a most efficient call center, is how quickly can we, can we get calls through the pipe and can we resolve calls to the customer's satisfaction. For one call center environment I got a chance to work with with some colleagues of mine, the, the, the problem was clear. We, we had a number of different call center representatives that were brand new to the company. And not only that, we also had the situation where calls, the volumes were super high and the calls were lasting way too long. So we introduce a core concept in organizational behavior management called the ABC model, antecedents, behavior, and consequences. If you're not familiar with the ABC model, FIT ABA Online offers a number of different courses that can help you get an introduction to this premise of the science of human behavior. But in short, the ABC model help leaders in this call center environment truly understand what behaviors they wanted from the call center reps, like fast turnaround time on calls, what antecedents or triggers needed to be put in place, like policies, procedures, and training, and job aids, to really prompt and really trigger those behaviors to happen, and finally, the consequences. These are the outcomes of behavior, so good quality performance feedback, data on how the individuals were performing, and fundamentally, that consumer satisfaction. Did the customer get satisfied results of the call? Now, we trained hundreds of leaders on the ABC model, and what we were trying to do was get the leaders to understand their role in the equation. Can you guess what their role in the equation was? Well, if the performer is who's doing the behavior, the leader's job is to apply the right antecedents and the right consequences to make that behavior happen. So we trained hundreds of leaders in this model, and fundamentally what happened was the following. Well, we boiled it down to strong versus weak adopters. The strong adopters were those leaders that were able to apply antecedents, behavior, and consequences effectively and timely to, to make change happen in those employees. And what we documented was that the strong adopters were able to demonstrate an improvement of three times the rate higher than those weak adopters. Weak adopters were essentially leaders that were kind of lackadaisical, if you will, kind of, kind of slow to really pick up the ball and kind of run with it and apply some effective change. So this graph just highlights the difference between somebody that takes on the ABC analysis tool and applies it in real time to, to help those employees make the change they need to make. So think about that from your workplace perspective. Remember that one thing that you identified that could improve? If you strongly adopt some of these uh, methodologies like the ABC model, you can be sure that you can see impact in real time. Let me share with you another story. This is from, I call this the case of the death care company, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and profit, oh my. Now, the death care company was a nationwide in the United States and parts of Puerto Rico, and they were effectively uh, managing um, funeral services as well as cemetery services. Now, not to go morbid on you, but in essence, what they were really focusing on was customers being satisfied with the services that were being provided in the funerals and funeral homes and the cemeteries. So in short, what we did here was focus in on what, how they were going to effectively measure, measure the impact of making such a positive difference happen for the customer satisfaction. We coined the term the quadruple bottom line, and this was in collaboration with the organization and with myself and some colleagues, where we decided to say, what is it that you're trying to measure and why? So the first element here was to look at the behavior and the business results. And we wanted to see some significant achievement of fostering some critical few behaviors. So one behavior, for example, was in the cemetery, where if you think about headstones in a cemetery, they are actually uh, on top of soil. And over time, if it's not taken care of, those markers will sink in the soil. Customers were complaining all the time about their loved one's headstone being uh, driven into the dirt. 
So employees rallied around this and they, their behavior was to make sure that they were all leveled so that it, in eye horizon, you can see all the markers are leveled and even. That produced a significant return in customer satisfaction. So that first bottom line, behavior and business results. The second one we called was deployment effectiveness. This is making things happen faster, more consistent, and more lasting improvements. So remember I said this was an organization around the United States and Puerto Rico? Our goal was to figure out how do we help this organization go faster, consistent, and make these uh, changes last a very long time. The third one was that organizational culture perspective. So this is achieving those results, but doing it the right way. Sure, we can probably impact customer satisfaction a number of different ways, but is it the right way and is it the right thing to do? So this organization was absolutely focused on this element called culture, and that's how we measured it. Are we getting the right results and are we doing it the right way? And finally, leader manager effectiveness. So this was about improving some core leadership skills and coaching skills in terms of the management behaviors so that when employees are being asked to do things, they're getting enough positive feedback, enough direction, enough coaching to enable them to perform the right way. Now this quadruple bottom line had amazing impact on the organization and it's highlighted here and you can't see this for, uh, I, I didn't want to blow this up for you, but the intent here is that each one of these are actually quotes from employees and managers alike on the impact that OBM had on culture, deployment effectiveness, leader manager effectiveness, and behavior and business results. So fundamentally, this OBM project was an organizational-wide, systemic-wide change project. And the goal was not just simple behavior results, but it was a combination of these four elements. I want to turn you into another story, and this is in the area of behavior-based safety. I was working in a company up in northern Alberta, Canada, the frozen tundra, if you will. And in the, in the darkest days, the cold weather can get anywhere between minus 30 and minus 50 degrees. And once you hit past minus 25, Celsius and Fahrenheit are the same. So it is cold. But why I bring you to that attention is that there are hundreds and thousands of workers working outside this frozen tundra in the oil sands industry. They're operating some of the largest trucks and largest shovels in the world. And fundamentally, their job is to produce oil from the oil sands. So in this project, we were working with the company on production. So how do we get more yield out of our trucks and shovel operation? We worked tirelessly on making things more efficient, more productive, uh, looking at the ways that trucks are driving through the mine to see if we can get them to the end point faster of dumping their loads. One hard day in, in the cold winter nights, an accident happened, a fatality happened, where a young woman uh, under the age of 30 was driving a truck and another truck came from behind her and actually hit her because their, that truck's brakes had failed. That day shattered this company to its core, and it shattered our very uh, focused efforts as con external consultants, because fundamentally what was missing here was a sure focus on everyone's safety as we were trying to improve productivity. So this OBM project turned its head. We were focusing on production, and then we moved to safety. So why I highlight this is that OBM practitioners and researchers learn from these kind of valuable lessons and that whatever we do, we make sure to focus on not just one piece of a pie in an organizational success story, but the whole picture. So for the oil sands, it comes with no surprise to you probably. You can't just focus on production, you have to focus on safety as well. This next case example comes to you from the Philippines. I want to introduce you to Bob and his friends. Bob and his friends work out in boats in the Philippines, and what they're tasked to do from the company I used to work for was actually go fish for seaweed. Seaweed was a product that we used for several different products in our chemical process plants. Bob and his friends would go out to the ocean every day to seek out tons of seaweed uh, for this pr process. As you can see from the bottom picture, what they would do is then bag the seaweed up, put it on their heads, and actually walk several feet to the processing plant 
for the seaweed to get produced and, and cleaned up. In this case example, the OBM practitioner, me in this case, was actually tasked to introduce improvements in behavior-based safety processes. Mind you, this was a, an area in the world where behavior-based safety was never talked about, was never taught, and needless to say, safety was kind of an afterthought because most people worked for very low wages. Jobs in the Philippines in this, in this manner, you know, high paying jobs, were actually very few and far in between. And they really liked what they did, but their culture as an environment in terms of going out on boats and fisheries and, and fishermen alike, they really just did it in everyday attire. There was no PPE, protect, uh, personal protective equipment, for doing what they did every day. And remember, they were contractors. So there was kind of some limitations in terms of what we could expect them to do. All that being said, this is a great case example of OBM having to do the right thing, which was to secure their safety. So Bob and his friends understood that the fundamental reason we were implementing behavior-based safety was to make sure they were safe every day. Fortunately, what we introduced to them was a different type of procedures for carrying the cargo, for not putting it on their head, but putting it on dollies, for example, wearing certain PPE like shoes, because they weren't uh, really acquainted to wearing shoes every day, uh, and closed toed shoes, mind you. So what we introduced was some fundamentals in doing work observations, giving feedback, and really focusing on some very simple, safe-related behaviors, and they rallied around it no problem. I want to talk about a case study right here in the United States. Now, this, might, uh, this picture might seem a little bit odd to you, so I want to try to explain what's happening uh, in terms of the task. So I want you to picture a pot of soup uh, being boiled on top of your stove. And the soup's ready. So you're going to take a soup ladle, right, in your hand, and the goal here is you're going to take that soup ladle, you're going to go into the pot, get some soup, and you're going to pour it in a bowl. Sounds yummy, right? All right, now I want you to picture that soup, but about 500 degrees hotter than your average soup temperature. Well, that's what's happening here. This individual is in an aluminized suit built by Nassau engineers because the soup ladle that he's using is actually being dipped in a, in a, um, in a machinery that's holding molten lithium metal. And it is some of the hottest substances in the world that we use to actually produce things like lithium batteries. So this individual, who I protected his face to, to save his innocence, right? He's a hardworking individual right here in the US. Every day, he works in this aluminized suit for several times a day, takes that soup ladle, and he actually goes into that um, uh, machinery of molten lithium metal to collect lithium to then later produce things like lithium batteries. Now, I was asked as the OBM practitioner to ensure this individual's safety because what was happening every day was more than likely an individual was going to get a chemical burn because remember that soup ladle? Well, sometimes the soup kind of spills a little bit. Have you ever had that happen? Well, more often than not, that was happening in this case too. But remember that temperature I said? It was over 500 degrees hotter than your average soup. So the moment that that little bit of lithium metal would spill, they only had seconds to get out of that aluminized suit before the lithium would burn right through it and actually uh, burn their skin. So this was one of those tasks in the entire company's history that had never truly engineered it to get, uh, get those uh, injuries removed and reduced. So my job as the OBM practitioner was try to figure out what behaviors can the individual do to be safer every day. Well, I'm just going to uh, just cut down to it. My advice was to get the man out of the job, get the man out of the suit and automate this system so that you don't have to have a person with a soup ladle going in and, touch, and getting involved in that lithium metal to begin with. So the organization adhered to the advice of myself and several engineers, and they're on their way to making this an automated system. So in some cases, the OBM practitioner's job is actually to recommend doing something totally different than some type of behavior change. 
Here's another case example. Now you see there's some blocks here of people's faces. That's to, again, to protect their innocence. But let me highlight to you what's happening here. This is actually a picture of people celebrating, celebrating success. However, in their culture, it was a rare thing for them to celebrate successes. But in this case, they actually achieved 1 million man hours without any personal injury to any employees, and they had roughly about 100 employees in their manufacturing facility. So the OBM practitioner, myself, was actually brought in to assess what are they doing and how are they doing it to achieve such high records of, of safe, uh, safe work uh, practices. And I found that they were doing a number of things, good policies, good procedures, and good management practices to, to listening and, and adhering to the employee's advice when things needed to get better. The only thing they weren't doing was actually taking time to celebrate with the employees. So this picture was an OBM intervention, if you will, to just celebrate the good things that are happening. And they had a great time with that. But what we wanted to do was sustain that practice. So a new management behavior was put in place, which was to take data on safe work practices and actually look at milestones and goals to hit that they would then celebrate with the staff. OK, here's another example that I always find interesting and personally um, uh, very influential to my career so far. And this was out in India. Now, in India, I was brought to India for another manufacturing facility looking to improve their safe practices. As I was driving in the taxi cab on the way to the facility, I found myself inundated with people that were riding motorcycles or, or mopeds and people that were just crossing the street in front of ongoing traffic. Coming from the United States, this was quite appalling, and I was kind of nervous about it and trying to figure out this, uh, what is the culture in India, and this is what my introduction was. Now, these are lovely people, and they, have, they work hard, and they have great intentions, but this is what was being reinforced in the society. In the one picture, you can see uh, a, a gentleman riding a moped, and he's wearing essentially a scaffolding on top of him while he's driving. On the other picture, you see three, three individuals crossing in front of the car I was in. Now, I had to say to myself, what am I expecting or what am I about to walk in when I go to this manufacturing facility who brought me in to talk about safety? Well, the good news is, much to my surprise, the plant manager of this facility actually took safety to heart. What he did was every employee that was riding motorcycles to work, their expectation was they had to wear helmets to go to work. And they were not allowed in the facility unless they were wearing a helmet. Now, why do I emphasize this point? From an OBM practice perspective, this was about setting clear expectations and not leaving any room for variation. This plant manager set very clear expectations, which was actually against the general culture of the society. As you can see the gentleman there not wearing a helmet, that was actually more of the norm. So this plant manager, his OBM intervention, if you will, was to solve for safety before they even get into the plant. So I encourage you to listen to this case study that you can change behavior even if it's against the overarching culture of the society. This is a fun case study I call Big Cookies, Little Cookies. This was a change management project in its finest, a merger and acquisition of a large company right here in the United States, purchasing and acquiring and, and then merging with smaller companies out in Europe. The company in the United States was a food manufacturing company. Yes, they manufactured cookies. The company that they purchased in Europe was also a food manufacturing, but very specialized in the European market. So they were little cookies. So the big cookie company purchased the little cookie company. And the OBM practitioner, myself and colleagues, were brought in to effectively manage this merger and acquisition. The reason why they were so sensitive to make sure this was successful, well, one, it was a multi-million dollar deal. And two, the two companies in Europe were actually competitors. So competitors were being asked to come together to work together and at a human level, some of those people didn't like each other, and they knew each other for years as competitors going after the same customer base. So the OBM practitioner had to figure out what is it that the company is trying to achieve? What are the goals? What are the expectations? And what's the time frame for this change to happen? Well, I'll boil it down to you. 
They wanted to make sure the multi-million dollar deal was successful in terms of return on investment. They wanted people to fundamentally work together on specific processes like sales and marketing and business development. And third, the time frame under one year. This was a huge endeavor and I'm proud to say it was very successful. But OBM practitioners often, more often than not get involved in these huge change management practices. Now, just a couple of things I want to iter iterate in terms of change management. If you haven't picked these books up, I highly recommend a couple of books. One is Who Moved My Cheese? It's, an, it's, it's a look at the human behavioral side of change. It's a great book by Dr. Spencer Johnson. And another book uh, that's actually written by a behavioral scientist, Dr. Julie Smith, is called It Happens, How to Become Change Resilient. It's a great book, and it's actually the book that we used for this change management project for Big Cookie, Little Cookie. Another case example that, I, that is totally different from the previous ones is a case example around looking at online learning and consumer behavior. My colleague and I were looking at the very behavior of how people purchased what we were looking for them to purchase in an online environment, such as this one. So our consumers are buying courses online, and we were interested to understand how do we influence buying behavior, and more importantly, how do we look at consumers' expectations of the very courses that we were producing. So what are they looking for? What kind of topics? And what quality are they expecting to achieve? So OVM practitioners pride themselves on the use of data and looking at data so that we are applying scientific uh, solutions to impact behavior in a positive way. So my colleague and I delved deep into data. We looked at competitors. We looked at our own program in terms of changing names and social media and the impact that it had on the name change and influencing people uh, 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 interacting with us on social media. We also wanted to know what the demand was. So we started looking at topics and that's that, that far, uh, the, the clouds, if you will, the customer demand. And we were asking, what topics are you most interested in? That's the customer demand analysis and social media. So we looked at this data to really understand what consumers wanted and where they were going in terms of competitors and in terms of interacting with us on social media. Finally, we looked at behaviors of our consumers. So we looked at the behaviors of actually uh, going to our courses and registering for our courses. And then finally, we looked at it in relation to the requirements of the uh, consumers that were attending to our courses. So in this case, we were looking at when the Behavior Analytics Certification Board, the BACB, their exam dates were and how that influenced our consumers uh, taking courses. Finally, we didn't want to just stop there. The consumers were giving us feedback on our instructors. So we, were, we decided we wanted to provide feedback to the instructors so that that can influence their presentation behaviors. As an instructor of some of these courses, I get feedback all the time from our students, and it really helps me understand what can I do better as a presenter. So this case example illustrates OBM in terms of the use of data and science-based science solutions to really making a positive difference in the world of consumers. This next case example is one of my favorites. Let me introduce you to Mr. Bowtie. This is a story about ethics and organizational culture. Mr. Bowtie is an executive of a company a very large company, multi-international company. His expectations are super clear. He wants results. However, Mr. Bowtie has a team, just like most executives do, and what he tries to do is motivate the team to achieve those business results. However, as a former team member of Mr. Bowtie, I firsthandly can tell you his methods of motivation were, let's just say, not the best not ideal. Mr. Bowtie would walk into a regular meeting where the team members were sitting, commencing to talk about business and talk about the results that were being achieved and the initiatives that were being implemented to achieve those results. Mr. Bowtie would come waving his finger and his goal was to point said finger to individuals in the room to tell them how bad of a job they were doing. He wasn't looking at data, 
He wasn't listening to what was happening. He essentially came in with some conceived notion of what was actually happening, and he was looking to place the blame on members of the team. Now, senior manager team, this is a senior management team, right? So we have accountability and responsibility. But from an OBM perspective, we would say that behavior is a little bit questionable because what he was fundamentally doing was not just pointing the finger and placing blame, he was putting threats in the very people that he was asking to achieve performance. He would even go as far as to say, if you don't shape up, you're fired. And he would place said threat over and over and over again. Now, these were not empty threats because he had achieved said, uh, he had achieved that outcome in the past. So the point here is that we have, as an OBM practitioner and OBM as a practice and a field of study, we look at this behavior carefully in terms of the role that an executive plays on influencing the behavior of their people. We talk about leadership and culture in various different ways, but from an OBM perspective, we fundamentally look at the behavior and ask ourselves, what is the intent of the individual and what is the impact that they're having on other people? In this case, in the case of Mr. Bowtie, there was definitely a question on ethics and unethical behaviors and the type of culture that he was driving, which essentially was a lot of avoidance behavior. So his staff was avoiding him at every chance they could. Now, something in respect to leadership that I wanted to leave you with that's from an OBM perspective are four ways that your leadership may be encouraging some unethical behavior. And these were some of the same behaviors that we saw in this case of Mr. Bowtie. The first is punishing speaking up. You want people to be able to speak up, voice concerns, challenge the status quo, and even come up with some solutions. But if there's a leader like Mr. Bowtie kind of punishing speaking up, it's driving the wrong culture. And so an OBM practitioner will hone in on that behavior and talk to Mr. Bowtie and coach them on the role of the executive to properly reinforce speaking up and not punish it. The second is applying excessive pressure to reach un unrealistic performance target. I mentioned that Mr. Bowtie had very clear expectations that he wanted results. But there were some cases that those results were not achievable and very unrealistic. So we want to make sure that when we are applying OBM solutions, we are fundamentally asking the question, is the target achievable? Third, not making ethical behavior and integrity a routine conversation. There was no question. There was a lot of unethical behaviors happening in this case, and I only mentioned a couple. But when you're talking about ethics in the workplace, and it's becoming more and more a, a real important topic in the world, we want to really figure out how do we talk about ethics and make it a, a routine conversation in the workplace. And number four, not setting the example. In this case, if all of the senior managers under, uh, under the responsibility of Mr. Bowtie wave their finger at their staff, what kind of culture would we be promoting? So Mr. Bowtie and executives around the world and managers need to set the example of what good leadership looks like. What culture are we trying to encourage and how do we get there through the right way? So I want to leave you with this. What is OBM? It's Organizational Behavior Management. But why OBM? Why Organizational Behavior Management compared to other disciplines of study? Well, to put it simple, we use a behavioral scientific approach to helping organizations to achieve a variety of different things, whether it's to improve something, improve productivity, improve safety, improve efficiency, whether it's to sustain something that's going well. So if you have an initiative or a set of initiatives that's really working, is it going to last? If you wanna grow some aspect of your company, whether it's grow the market share or grow revenue or even grow in the talent of your people. And finally, engage. Engaging customers and employees in very different ways to make long-lasting positive change. So why OBM? Because the principles of behavior influence every one of us. And we should turn the light on on ourselves, on our behaviors, and the organizational's culture to make sure that we're making a positive impact in the workplace. And that's why OBM is a good thing. I want to leave you with some recommended readings in case you're interested in pursuing OBM or learning more about organizational behavior management. It is a great field of study. It's a great practice field. And 
Around the world, people are making positive difference in the workplace using organizational behavior management. Thank you for listening and see you real soon. Thank you.